Welcome to the next big thing, the 2469 Community Podcast. Joining us today, we have Ajax Batter, co founder and CEO of Bellman Media, Sylvia Eldawi, founder of Propology, Alex Bishkov, CEO of Teleporta, and Chris McDonald, founder of Creative Broadcast Agency. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Next Big Thing. Uh, today, we're here to discuss a little bit about uh, branding and marketing and startups and what can startups do to beat this. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I would like to start this by, by asking, I mean, in our case, we've been part of a tech startup and then we transitioned into a media agency. So we kind of seen this uh, challenge from both from both ends, right? Um, so what do you think are some of the challenges that a startup can face when they go into market for the first time? Like how do they get new clients? How do they get more awareness? How do they show their, their company out there? It's the immediate call will be, do we hire an external marketing agency? And this is definitely a challenge that I've um, experienced is selecting that marketing agency, um, trying to translate your vision for the mm -hmm. business, uh, getting them to understand and ultimately what uh, what gets produced in the end. It's, mm. This is a, a, a real challenge. And then you end up having these kind of relationships you could jump from one marketing agency to another and yeah. how does that affect your your brand messaging and your consistency right yep of course how is that not shown to the outside world that okay this is someone else yeah. speaking now uh i think it's uh now from the uh startup point of view from when we were in the startup um something that we were facing at the time that when we transitioned, we tried to be very aware of this is the um, position in which a startup is, you know, when they approach us to start working on something like this. Of course, if you have all the resources in the world, I always say, I always use the same analogy. If you go to a tech event and you have 10,000 business cards, of course, you're going to give business cards to everyone. Someone may reply. Like some people may mean business. Some people are just like, okay, just take a card and see what happens. Uh, the thing is, if you have 10 business cards, you go with a different approach. You have to be very precise and very accurate on how you use those resources to get the results that you need. Because in the case of a startup, you're also struggling to survive. Let's say it's not like you can afford, ah, oh, we'll do this for six months and see what happens. We may not exist in three months. Uh, so that position to um, have to make the most of the, out of the resources that you have, I think it what brings what brings the challenge to the startup and what's interesting for us, I would say, as an agency to use all the resources we can to provide, okay, this is the best strategy that we think for you right now. Within your price bracket. Yeah. Of course. Exactly. That. What do you feel? Uh, <clears throat> what can I say? Uh, in my experience, uh, startups sometimes hire agencies or marketers too early uh, before they uh, realize the value uh, that mm. they want to bring to the world. Yeah. Uh, as for us, we hired uh, one day we hired business development manager, and now uh, we we don't work together anymore because she found a lot of you know like uh, troubles in the product and all this stuff, and that's why we came back to uh, creating a value for our uh, for our customers, and. Uh, I'm a big fan of understanding that the first salesman should should be the founder. Founder should not rely on someone else, right? And previously, I had a marketing agency, and I sold it. And uh, trust me, my worst uh, worst clients were startups uh, because <laughs> they have a lack of resource, a lack of understanding what should we sell, how to make it, uh, you know, like. Uh, lifetime value of the customer, how, how to make it longer mm. and all this stuff. Yeah. But when startup realized it, uh, he became he becomes a super good client, I believe. Yeah, yeah? yeah. because uh, it can work with thousands of uh, customers uh, so and worldwide. So uh, 
real uh, international startup. It's a very uh, nice business to try to help him to get more customers and all this stuff. So, but uh, you should not do this too early before mm-hmm. you realize the value you are selling to customers. But there are some things that you do need to do super early, which is have a name. Yeah. So you can secure the website, so you mm-hmm. can have the emails. Yeah. And then do you have a .com? Is it available? Do you put a variation on it? What are our brand colors? So that's why I think there is a um, an urgency to it because so much else rides on it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right in the way of saying consistency is key with with the branding and I always have that DIY approach. Hiring a marketing team and then having it not go the way. But this does flow into the what you're saying about startups and um trying to start up yourself as well. Hmm. You know, if if you're a startup company and you're trying to outsource your work because you need help because you're too busy doing the actual work it's um it's a to and fro that's very difficult to to navigate so you kind of have to find the consistency within yourself to in order to create what is this in your mind Mm -hmm. rather than trying to project to someone else hey i would like this product to -hmm. look like this so i find that the um is allowing yourself the time to create that yeah. that and that um what what is you want to bring to to light yeah i actually i support the um, uh we are in a, in a strange position because for, on one side we are an agency but on the other side we are kind of uh also running the communication for 2469 and uh sometimes the advice comes okay from the startup community point of view of course i advise people to do their uh, first approach into what they consider is going to work for them um, because there's really not a recipe for success and what works what works for a company in the same industry as you may not work for you as well. Uh, but one thing that I was getting from both ends is this um, challenge that was coming from the amount of um, information, like the, the variety of information that they can find out there. Uh, I had actually this conversation this week um, with a startup and the conversation was like, I, if I go online and I see, for example, I don't know, Gary B saying, oh, I have to create 15 TikToks per day to become relevant or whatever. So it's organic social media that I need to focus on. And then I go and I see, I don't know, Neil Patel saying like, no, we did this research and it turns out that email marketing and SEO are the only things that are working, are, are they giving the best ROI? So which one do I follow? Because I don't have resources to go all over the place to try everything and see what actually works for me. Um, and I think it goes back to, the, to this thing that we were saying at the beginning. Since there is no recipe to success, uh, the best thing that someone can offer you in this case, whether it's an agency or a marketing expert in your team or anyone, is the suggested best strategy based on the available information and data that we have, based on the research that we've done of your competitors, of your market, of your uh, like business. This is the suggested be- best action plan. Then, of course, it may vary and it's important to be able to pivot quickly into the direction of success if you see something's not working. But that's kind of the, that's kind of where we are most of the week, like a little bit on one side, a little bit on the other side <laughs> and trying to, uh, yeah. <laughs> to provide both. Well, it's all based around the collaborative approach and mm-hmm. utilizing your network. So I find that the collaborative approach where both parties are working together and it works out that you know you have a great skill, that person has a great skill, then building up together is always the best way when you're starting up. Um, you know, there's a few brands and music channels that I've helped create, and it's all worked on that trust. Um, but allowing that openness and trust is is quite difficult, especially in, mm-hmm. in the environment that we're in right now. Um, but it's you know it's, it's it's all about building relationships and networks and continuing building and working together which are all kind of human rather than graphic design or Mm. marked you know business cards or and and that's another kind of shift that i see happening is it's no longer necessarily about the company brand the logo the business it's more 
and Gary Vee's always saying about the personal brand. Mm. So it's the founders. It's it's not so much about pushing the this new Instagram page with ten followers, you know, <laughs> that we've created, um, but actually continuing that message through the founders. Um, and that's something that I did recently. I um, I met. Well, I'm not going to call it a mistake. I needed to do it, so mm. I set up my brand page and it wasn't until my brand page which is only nine months old when this happened um it got more followers than i got and i was like well look at this <laughs> the brand overtaking the brand master we will not have this <laughs> and i started shifting to instead of posting from propology i started posting from sylvia Eldawi. and actually i was like people want to see more human yeah. rather than the business. I mean, the business page still had hum a human element to it, but because it's kind of like, this is a brand pushing its message, I'd rather hear it from Sylvia. So how do you feel about the power of personal branding and the power of corporate or company branding? Mm. Mm, I believe it's very important to have a strong brand uh, of the company because one day you, you'll hire your sales team and they will sell what you you are producing and for some companies it's very important uh, with which company they will start to working and uh, ceo's uh, personal brand can step aside at, at that time uh for example like i don't know uh examples like we work for example uh, we don't need a thing from adam newman we need a place to work from and to communicate from and that's why it's more interesting for us to understand what's going on with this place we want to rent and all this stuff yeah and maybe uh, sample uh, same stuff with other businesses like right because we need mercedes-benz not because of the history of the ceo but because we need uh, four wheels and <laughs> to go somewhere in the comfort or in in the right speed yeah yeah but mercedes doesn't sell the car like wh whenever you look at its advertising it's not talking about the car it's talking about the the lifestyle that goes with having that car you know yes but i have some friends who with the background of professional racing and they love this brand because uh, this brand means a lot yeah so uh, uh, different people see different uh, values in mm -hmm. in different stuff yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in that specific audience, that's the case. Like I imagine that whoever runs in Formula One is more about the performance of the car than the status. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although it may have a little bit of status. Of course, well. like of I course. I imagine that driving for Mercedes it can be like a... Of course. But at the same time, a person like Elon Musk, yeah, uh, we know only him and companies under him, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we don't know even different specifics of SpaceX, for example, yeah? yeah. But, but we know that Elon Musk wants to achieve something to come to Mars or anything like that. And it's interesting to to uh, watch after him, you know, and his moves and all this stuff. Yeah. I, I think that that is like an example of what you were saying before, that Elon Musk, Elon Musk has developed his personal brand so much that whatever he goes into, oh, I'm going to do this now. Oh, okay. So suddenly this is a thing. Yeah. But because we are following his personal brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and... I agree in that aspect that the uh, the connection that you make on the with the human on the other side of the screen is more powerful. Like you can follow any account that is just like showing faceless content, right. but you will not have the same connection as with an account that actually shows a person speaking. You connect to this person in particular, a mission, a vision, whatever, like a message that they want to send out there. I I experienced that with my content as well. I try to do it content. I try to do content without me and with me, personal, personally speaking. Uh, and I could see in the interaction that, oh, okay, they are replying to me. In the other case, they are just like creating a debate out of the, the topic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that feeling that we were, uh, that you were mentioning before, uh, that is actually what constitutes the brand in itself. This, let's say, the brand in itself is not owned by the company, it's just stored by the company, but then it's co-created with the people that interact with it. So it's a it's a relationship in that matter. Like Mercedes puts the car out there and create this feeling around it, but the fact that we feel it is what makes Mercedes that the brand that it is. 
right? And then yeah. we keep feeding that. So I, I have a small question. So if you are talking about startups, uh, so startup, it is uh, a kind of a business that can rapidly grow. So it is maybe the main definition uh, mm. because uh, cafe, it is not a startup, it is a small business. So if you want to build a startup, you need to get investors and funds uh, to invest in this company to grow faster and so on. So uh, we should not forget about goals of a startup. Mm -hmm. So the main goal of a start as a startup, I can say that if uh, so, the main goal for us is to get from the idea stage to pre-seed stage, from pre-seed stage to seed, then from seed to A. Uh, from A to B, and then to sell the company, to make it profitable, or to make an IPO, for, for example. And all of this we sell to investors. And that's why they are waiting uh, for us to get from one stage to another. And if it is a goal, uh, the marketing should be uh, based on these goals, right? Mm -hmm. So. In the early stage, maybe there is no need to spend a lot of money on positioning and all this stuff, but to get from serious, from pre-seed to seed stage, for example. But seed stage means that you have customers and you have revenue already. Uh, and then bigger funds come to invest in this uh, company to get from seed stage to series A. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you get closer to series A, your revenue should be... One million dollar per year, for example, and there is a lot of marketing. Another like performance marketing, right? Mm -hmm. When you have leads, they should be cheaper, or they should be more uh, qualified, or they should be from bigger companies because these enterprises can pay a lot on your for your product, mm -hmm. yeah, and and all this stuff. And I think it's very important uh, to understand uh, stages of startups and, yeah. uh, seed start, seed startup. It is, uh, it is not a good customer, but series A startup or series B, it's a great customer. <laughs> okay. I would, uh, I, we have customers like from all the stages and I kind of find the appeal on each uh, stage. I like the, the first introduction, like whenever there's a very new startup, the first introduction into branding, let's call it, which is more of an education process on what they are here to offer. Uh, I uh, I like that uh, that first approach. Plus, I, it's interesting because they come with a lot of uh, preconceptions based on social media content, like I said mm. before, on Gary Vee or like anyone yeah. that they were watching. Uh, so it's always an interesting conversation because it starts sparking the creativity from their side whenever you start like asking about the resources that they have and how how they could use it depending on the goals. But yes, those goals will change yeah. Like during this uh, journey of a startup that you sure. described, those goals are, are going to keep changing. However, the, the brand building process is going to take several years during yeah. that time. So the, the best time to start was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Today, yeah. Yeah. But actually that process of helping build the brand, like I know you mentioned not to start too early, but I find that going through the exercises that the marketing agency will give you at the beginning, like, you know, who is your your audience, mm. um, demographics, what brand language, what colors, what, you know, having that, go, having going through that exercise at the very early stage actually helps the business side of the business. Cause it's probably yeah. the first time that the founders actually think, hold on, let me think about my ideal client. Let me think about do I want to be mid range? Am I budget? Am I, uh, whatever it may be. So a lot of, it's a bit like, therapy to some degree, like sit down, <laughs> yeah. let's just do an analysis of your business where you think you are. And going through that process will actually help you think you may even change direction slightly based on what you learn about what you're trying to build in that stage. Yeah. Yeah. What's the story you want to take, mm. want to tell? In the end, people will relate to the story that you're telling more than, yeah, yeah. more than anything sure. else, I would say. Sure. Well, in terms of content, at least. Well, uh, I have a friend, um, one day, uh, so it was era of, uh, crypto, like, I mean, ICOs, if you mm -hmm. remember, it was, I don't know, 2016, yeah. 2017, uh, his story, uh, I will not tell names and all this stuff, but <laughs> he had a car, uh, as the only asset he had 
these days. Okay. Uh, then he saw like what what started to happen with ICO market and all this stuff, and he knew one marketing agency. Uh, so they were like more like branding agency at the same time. He sold this car, so uh, he loved what what they have done. He came to negotiations here uh, to understand the pricing and all this stuff. He understood understood that uh, they want a lot of money, but uh, he loved uh, their jobs. Uh, the only way to pay for his, uh, you know, like uh, mm. for, for, for his offer was uh, to sell his car and to pay to this marketing agency. And he betted on it. He sold his car. Uh, he invested all the money he had uh, in this uh, uh, packaging of his idea. And he raised $10 million of dollars on the ICO. So it really, uh, sometimes it happens like this. Okay. I wish like I could tell a story. <laughs> yeah. So he is crazy about it, but but with this vision, he would succeed anyway. You know. No, yeah, of course. It's kind of that mindset: double or nothing. Yeah, 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 nothing. yeah. 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 So I, I often, when I'm about to purchase like a new microphone or something, I go, you know, I need two more of these, <laughs> and then look at the bank account, like, oh, <laughs> should I be doing this? Ah, double yeah. or nothing. It's the, it, it, it'll pay off. It'll pay off. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's that gamble, isn't it? It's that trying to take take the leap, go across the barrier, just get get to the other side, and and just pray that it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like yeah. your your friend got lucky there. But the best way to build wealth, uh, if you have nothing, so you can build a company. Yeah. Right. Which mm. which cost money. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, I mean those kind of decisions of course you have to be passionate about what you're doing in order to make those kind of let's say irrational decisions which in the end is pretty much like what every startup founder goes through at some point otherwise if you if you analyze it rationally it's like okay like most of the startups won't survive the fifth year i don't know if this is a safe bet but yet we have a lot of people going into entrepreneurship a lot of people trying to pursue this social mobility so uh, i always the find end, the best way to, like the mindset i find is is find a job but then look at the job as your first client because then that yeah. job will pay for the the initial startup costs mm. and just constantly think like hey let's get another job on top of that job and with with the way the world went over the last few years with remote working and everyone moving more digital it's become a lot easier to do this kind of stuff um and then yeah perhaps you know outsourcing a little bit of the work as well kind of helps I mean, that's how initially a lot of people can start up is just really think like my job is my first client. It's not a job because a lot of people I speak to are just like, oh, I don't like my job. I really wish to start a business. Well, just think of it in a way that no, th this this job is is a client. And then it, it totally changes your mindset. You just kind of go, OK, let's go get the next client. Yeah. OK. That, that was a good thing to hear back in 2007 for me. Yeah. <laughs> when I had my first job, I was like, okay. I, I went through that part. Like, I, I don't like my, my job. I wanted to be a filmmaker Yeah. By the, at the time. But I was in, in a small city in Argentina. There were not, not a lot of filmmaking opportunities. And sadly, the, we didn't have a lot of social media either. That kind of gives away my age, right? Like, I... I, I, but that by then, I, I know you're in filmmaking as well. By then, when if we wanted to shoot something, we had to go and rent the cameras, right? And they were like these cameras, the kind of like you go on your shoulder and hurt your back. And the helicopter instead of drones. It was like that. <laughs> when I first discovered, uh, uh, by then it was like, whatever we are going to do, I think, by the way, this is what got me the job here in Dubai. Uh, because I made most of my experience trying to make something with no with no resources. So when I spoke to, uh, you know, Jamil, right? When I spoke to Jamil the first yeah, time, sure. it was like, uh, everything that you see there was done by me because I don't have a team. I'm here alone. Uh, and I think that was an attractive thing. As a startup, would say, okay, then you should come and do the marketing because we have no resources mm -hmm. and we need to tell like crazy stories. Um, but yeah, it, it was kind of that thing that I think drew me to the uh, startup side and now, is driving the the way that we want to manage the agency as well. Understanding understanding exactly where the startup is positioned in their journey and what actually they need at this stage. To be honest, like I, this is probably not the best thing to say in terms of the business side, but for me, 
I don't want to get uh, startups on a yearly retainer. I want to say, okay, in the stage where you are, this is what you should be doing and that we should be doing. We are betting on your success as well. Mm. We want to partner on the success of the startups. That's why we are so invested in the startup journey. That's part of, part of the idea. It's a nice idea. By the way, what do you think about when startups can pay you by shares? What, what, what do you think? For you mm. as a marketing agency. I've been burnt by that one. <laughs> huh? I've been burnt a few times with this one. It's it's yeah. like again, it's the trust thing I was talking about earlier on. You know, it's built on trust and then you just kind of think, mm, where's this going? You know, what what are you actually doing? But and if you love this startup, for example. Yeah, but that's exactly it. I mean, you know, you do love it, otherwise you wouldn't do it, right? Mm. If you, mm. you you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't even bother with it, you'd just be like but yeah, when I'll, when you when you put your creativity your everything your passion into something and then it doesn't quite go the way you think it was going to go or you know maybe you were going a bit too fast for other people or they were they were waiting for something i don't know but it's 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 a difficult one like the whole startup for shares i think is a bit personally i don't know, I, don't, I don't agree with it maybe but. you know this uh, Sorry. No, 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 please. <laughs> Maybe you know these stories like Beyonce uh, was on the stage at Uber's, uh, you know, like uh, in the early days, Uber mm, had a party yeah. and they paid by shares yes. to her. And then the shares yeah. started to, I don't know how, how, how much, uh, like $50 million or something like that. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know. We've, we've done it. <laughs> we've done the, uh, the service for equity kind of thing. But I think it's because if, if the founder can sell the idea to me to work in exchange of equity, then, okay, he's already, he made already the first step into the uh, personal branding thing. So if he, if he can sell it like this in combination with what we're going to do, he's going to be, mm. I mean, I want to bet on his success, mm. but it's only in cases where we know that, okay, I have a lot of faith in this. I know that the, the idea or the tech behind this, it's actually going to, it has a lot of potential. But again, like we also, we work very closely with Ahoy. So whenever the tech team from Ahoy, which I respect tremendously, if they tell me, oh, this is a great idea, then okay, I, I know you know what you're talking yeah. about. Like I, I trust you. But to be serious, one day I wanted to pay for the rent by shares. <laughs> <laughs> really? right. And uh, I was almost uh, successful <laughs> in this. Actually, the Nike logo as well was, uh, okay, even the Nike logo was paid $35, I think, in the 70s when it was first uh, done. Uh, I heard that afterwards, when it became the icon that, that it became, um, they paid some shares to the, mm. to the designer. An undisclosed amount, but I imagine that whatever may be. That's nice. That's nice, <laughs> yeah. I mean... And you're talking it's about now, which is good. It's good for them, right? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course. At, at, the, at the beginning, when it was first oh, but, designed. But let's be honest, there wasn't that much effort put into it. Uh, it was a tick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, uh, but that's, that's the thing. I mean, again, like I, I have like ambivalent opinions as an agency owner, let's say. Um, but I believe that in most cases, like logos are kind of overrated. Um, I understand that it's the first approach into what, most of the companies understand as branding. So of course they spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of, uh, um, yeah, resources into that. Mm -hmm. But in the end, uh, there's an exercise that I, that I'd like to do that I saw somewhere on YouTube. Um, if you like, if you have to think of a logo that you like, think of any logo that you, that you think, okay, this is a good logo. If you're not a designer that you're not judging it based on their design quality, Usually you're going to think of brands that you like and the logo that is associated with right. that brand, right? For some people, maybe Nike, for some people it can be something else. Apple, for example. The truth, I think there's a, there's one um, story that kind of illustrates actually the, the role that the logo plays in a company. And that is the Starbucks logo. I don't know if you know the story about the Starbucks logo, the, the original Okay, I'm going to try to summarize it because it's, uh, <laughs> but it's it's very interesting. So the when startup was uh, St Starbucks, sorry, when Starbucks was founded in, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, um, 
this 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 uh, company is from Seattle and it's very linked to the sea and to the port activity, yeah. right? They actually, I think the name Starbucks comes from Moby Dick, from the book Moby Dick. Uh, so when they wanted to draw a logo, they started researching everything about maritime stories and so on. And they decided they found this mythological creature that was the siren, not the mermaid. The mermaid is like the cool one, the little mermaid from Disney, Ariel, like singing under the sea. Now the bad one is called the siren, which is the one that used to sing to uh, sailors and pirates and like draw, draw them into the sea and then eat them. So it's not really a, like a positive connotation, <laughs> let's say. Uh, now to make, to take it one step further, they chose this specific siren that had the chest exposed and two tails that were spread open in a suggestive way. This is the, the original Starbucks logo. You can yeah, like yeah, Google yeah. it. Uh, now I imagine if uh, then in the, in the future, they started like making it more abstract and more acceptable for everyone else, because like to put it in the truck, it was kind of violent, <laughs> you know, to drive through Seattle with a half naked siren. siren. <laughs> yeah. It was, it wasn't very much accepted for the, <laughs> in the community. Um, so they made it a little bit more abstract, but in the end, I'm thinking like, if we had a client today that comes with the idea, oh, you know what? I have an idea for a logo. I want a half naked creature <laughs> that is going to eat people because that's how much my coffee is going to attract everyone. You wouldn't do that. I one. wouldn't go with that. I'd be like, okay, you know what? I think we... Do you think the impact of a logo is kind of, you know, since AI, everyone... In, my, in the back of my mind now, I'm just thinking, did I just pay someone to do a mid-journey of my logo? Mm. Mm. You know, like, do, do you think the impact of a logo now that you see one in this generation we're in now, it just, it's not as impactful or? I don't think it matters as much. You don't think it matters? No. no. Okay. No, like you said, you know, I would, well, I mean, now I have different reasons for not going to Starbucks, <laughs> but um, it seems perfect. It would have been acceptable, but to come up with it, is an absolute no, no. So, and it doesn't stop people from, no, of course, from going. So the, <laughs> it's just, uh, make something, put it out there, move on. You can spend so long. Yes. Yeah, procrastinating, was, deliberating, mm. and actually your business is running away yeah. from, from you, uh, because you're focusing on, and you you said a really good word earlier, uh, which I think is more important than the logo. And that's the storytelling, mm. which yes. is, which should be the the first year, two years worth of marketing yeah. and PR as well. Yeah, story is very important um, because some people want to join this story, some don't. Mm. Yeah, like investors or or a team or some someone. But in the end, it, it is what is going to resonate with the investor. It's like uh, I've heard this many times in the in the community in the talks, like. In a lot of cases, people invest in the founder more than in the startup in itself. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I believe in this person. I believe in the mission that it has. I believe in the idea more than the product. All right, the product, we can tweak it. But <laughs> this person deserves the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the opportunity. Like Netflix started with DVDs, yeah? Yeah. And all this stuff. YouTube kind of. started as a social media platform or something like that. Yes. Uh, and both of them were not accepted at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And then it became, yeah. But yes, this uh, that's a great message. And I would love everyone that's going to work with us at some point to know the, I, I understand it's the visual identity that we're going to develop and it's part of the visual identity, but it's a symbol. It's an, an empty vessel where you're going to pour your brand into, right. but it's not the brand. Right. It's the icon. Um, I like so what I, you said earlier on about the not holding back on the creation. So like, just getting it out there. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is kind of why I focus a lot around like live streaming and like the live consciousness of creation is because it's already out there. Like you're mm. streaming it or you're working with artists and it's actively moving with each other and creating and releasing whatever it is, artwork that you're doing. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with quite a few sort of artists and producers that are in the background. And they're sort of, you know, they're in the background working with artists, producing albums and stuff like that, but they've got their own artwork they want to create as well. Cause they're essentially being commissioned by 
another artist, right, to 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 sing or to rap over their, their stuff. And you know, when I when I've been around this sort of studio environment, you, you kind of see the the marketing strategy come up from within, and you see what they're doing. And like, for example, like <clears throat> I said this earlier on about networking. It's all about networking and and building. And I think that, like for example, and I'll give you an analogy. Like you have an album that's going to be released, say next week. You tell your friends, "Hey, come listen to my album. I've just produced it, finished it. It's a listening party." The next week, you know, you tell your friends, "Look, I'm just I'm going to make a a concert. It's going to be this amount of people in this venue." You drive up ticket sales, you get them to share it on their networks, you get support acts, you get them to share it on their networks. You then drive call to action, buy the tickets. And a lot of people now are starting to do live streams of of these concerts. And again, it's all to drive more. A lot of people are worried like it would take away from the ticket sales. But what you're trying to do really is to try and get the album sales, right? That's That's the main thing. And so... You know, you're at you're at a concert. People are sharing the fact that it's going to be live streamed. There's already people there. You tell them, tell them in the audience, "Hey, it's live streamed." And the idea, the call to action at the end of this is is essentially your album is going to be released at twelve o'clock. And at twelve o'clock, everyone purchases the album at the same time. Given that your fans are your fans, mm-hmm. you know, and then they're, yeah. they're supporting you. I'm sure they are if they're at your mm. your first album release. And again, this is all sort of utilizing your network and other people's networks and and this share factor. <clears throat> so in terms of a strategy, when it comes to sort of grassroots movements, trying to get something off the ground up, again, it's collaboration, trying to get as much energy around your project and utilize your network, be it graphic designers, producers, filmmakers, you know, all the mm. sort of creative mm. um, disciplines there are. Mm. And just driving it to that one point where you want to, this is an album, Release. this is a product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And but see, yeah. everything you've described there is that funnel. So every mm. founder has some kind of funnel mm. and yeah. you have, you know, it's bigger at the top and you've got to just put more in and some stuff might be free and you're just trying to work people through the funnel. Then you've got several calls to action and then hopefully it ends up in a transaction. But that's, you know, that it's it's easier to pour people into a funnel with stories, mm-hmm. with the person, with the human being, rather than a logo, uh, a name, a brand, yeah. a, a company Instagram page. And there's some statistics. I think it's like you get, I don't know if it was seven times more, com- uh, 7x the conversion rate if something, a sales lead generation post, let's say, if it's shared by the company versus if it's shared by an individual, seven times more likely to convert if it's shared by an individual Mm -hmm. than like standard lead generation tactics. So it's just little things like that. People don't want to feel sold to anymore. Mm. Yeah, They'd rather be thrown into a funnel and decide if they want to go down it or not. Um, yes and it's okay again, and, sorry and it, it is like i was uh seeing um this week the story about the uh, now just because it was i saw it in my house and i was uh like questioning about this you know the stanley cup that big mm, cup yeah. that became like very trendy um that for some reason i never noticed it then i saw my wife had it and i saw like all of our female friends had it uh which was strange because Stanley used to be a brand that was selling to a very specific, like, let's say blue collar men, you know, it was this thing that, yeah, this will keep your coffee hot for like 24 hours while you are doing whatever. Uh, And now they find, they found a completely new audience with a completely not new product, but with like a different product. Um, And I started doing a little bit of research on this. uh, And it it looked like it all started when that, uh, when a woman car set on fire, I think it was that that time. Oh yeah. The, the car set on fire, and she made a video about saying, "Hey, look, the cup is still here, and the coffee is still, and the the <laughs> drink is still cold inside." So the, um, I think it's the 
uh, sorry, sorry, I'm telling this story and some of the facts are like... No, but that, <laughs> the, the point is that's a story that we don't know if it's fact or not. Oh, but yeah. someone yeah. delivered that story and we've yeah. all bought... I've heard it, you've heard it. Yes. We've bought into it. So, and I've seen as well the adverts about Stanley. They're claiming, ah, oh, all the rage. And you just believe it immediately. They're telling a story and you're sold. So are you better off spending more time on the story than the than the font and mm. the hex codes and the... Yeah. yeah I, I've spent a long time editing and all of this, so I don't, I don't love the fact that it is like this, but the truth is the story keeps being like the first connection that people will make with whatever video you put out there. Uh, even though I do appreciate like all the post-production and all the 24 hours that I spend on After Effects trying to get all mm -hmm. the details right. Uh, but in the end, like you've seen videos that go viral and it's like one person shooting right. with a phone with a like low quality, but still you relate to the story. Oh, a little girl saving a puppy. Oh, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, you relate to that story more than, I think that's the easiest example that we can find with story re relatability versus the format that is being presented. Yeah. And I've been spending a lot of money. I'm kind of, I've reached my limit here now mm. when it comes to social media agencies. So typically it's made up of, you know, TikTokers in their 20s, 20, you know, 20s, early 30s. And they're convincing me that they're going to, you know, we know how it works and we're going to do this and mm. we're going to boost your visibility and you'll go viral and one in every, and you start believing it. You're like, <laughs> okay, right. Th these guys know what they're doing. And I, and then I'm reflecting, I'm looking back at it and I'm like, well, there's a spelling mistake. Well, there's a grammar issue. Um, and this caption doesn't mean anything. And actually they don't, you know, you are the founder of your business. Nobody knows the vision better than you. Nobody really knows your audience better than you. So how can you now pass on this responsibility to a team of kids, I'm going to call it, mm. I'm going to call it kids yeah. to, to, to run your message. And so I've decided, no, as, as long as it takes me and as time consuming as it is, let them do the, you know, create, they can create it. They can do the editing. Cause that's something I can't do. But as far as the messaging, the, uh, the, the caption, the hashtags and all of this, I will handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, as a startupers, we need to have goals. Uh, if you hire a social media agency, we need to understand what, what do you want to get, uh, with them to achieve with them. Yeah. Uh, if we don't know what we should achieve, we will achieve nothing, right? We will just spend money and in the end of the month or, or of the quarter, we will tell our investors that we, we got a thousand followers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what, what, what will give this thousand of mm. followers, right? But uh, for example, and instead of this, not having any marketing and even in logo, if you can sell something and have LOIs or contracts or even payments, it is. It is a real meaning that you are moving in the right direction, mm. right? For example, uh, you have a logo from Mid Journey, but uh, I'm not a fan of logos from Mid Journey. But mm. for example, if you have it for free, for example, for twenty dollars, but you have prepayments, that means that you are already on the right way, right? And after several, I don't know, months, you can hire an agency which can give you a different name, a different uh, story. Uh, and it will help you to achieve more customers. Um, that's uh, it means that it is also right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, also what what can I can tell uh, when startup is being created, you have one vision. But when you hire your investors, they have only one vision, how they will earn money on these investments. Mm -hmm. And if you will achieve $1 billion valuation, that means that they are very good investors and they earned uh, a lot of money, all this stuff. And um, if you really play this game in a billion dollar company, uh, you should achieve it, for example, in seven years. Now you cost $5 million and after seven years, you should uh, cost $1, $1 billion. Uh, you can just divide these numbers and it means that for your company, it costs, I don't know, $15,000 uh, one hour costs for you. And if you understand that uh, you can outsource something, I don't know, like for $15,000, a group of people will work, I don't know, 
10 weeks on your idea, it means that it is a fantastic deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. If it will help you uh, to, to, to get on this path to cost 100 million or a billion dollar. Yeah. So it's a great deal. But if you don't have any vision and you don't know that you go to the billion dollar and all this stuff, you should stop yourself and you should rethink and reimagine wh what you, you will do next. If you have this vision, you can hire anyone. You can hire ex Google, ex Facebook, ex Netflix. But if you're going to a billion dollar, right? Uh, capitalization. But if you don't do this, uh, you should uh, invest wisely. Yeah. Mm. Your. Yeah. And it's it's very uh, risky stage when you have I don't know thirty thousand dollars which left from the latest investment round and you need to attract more or to become profitable or something like that, mm. uh, uh, the, uh, that's when you risk it all. Mm -hmm. But then you lift the kind of social media lid up and then beneath it, you discover there's the digital marketing lid, which yeah. costs triple the amount, you know, yeah. oh, SEO and then your, um, yeah. you know, your Google ads and yeah. your this and your keywords. And yeah. it just, it can take over everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the challenge we were saying before, like, mm -hmm figuring all of that out while you're thinking about this. Okay, so I have this amount of money. This is the amount, the amount of time that we can survive on this mm. and I need to like get to the next stage. Yeah. And um, and we need to track it, put the pixels yeah. in, the meta trackers, yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, oh my <laughs> God. Yeah. But I bet on guerrilla marketing for very first month or maybe mm. years. Mm. What's guerrilla marketing? Yeah. Uh, it's like uh, achieving customers for free, like mm -hmm. getting customers for free. Uh, there are seven types of of this. So Lenny Rachitsky uh, has written a great uh, article about this. Uh, he told, so he discovered seven uh, ways to attract uh, uh, customers for free. And uh, he gathered all examples like from Netflix, Uber, mm -hmm. Tinder, uh, any, any of them. Uh, the first level is... Once again, your friends and family, <laughs> they can be your customers all, yeah. not only investors, but customers. After that, uh, influencers. Yeah. Instagram uh, appeared uh, in Silicon Valley because they had a friend uh, who was very famous in Twitter and he was a photographer and he didn't know how to use Twitter for himself. And that's why guys around Instagram, like Kevin Systrom, who created it, mm. he asked if you will make filters, if you will make photos, will you use it? Yeah. Mm. And after he started to use it, he has written about it in his Twitter. And that's why, uh, how they achieved yeah, mm. customers. Also, you have communities like 2469, for example. Uh, maybe 10,000 people uh, already around this community, right? Yeah. Uh, and you can get customers out from there. Also, you can just, I don't know, come to show your deck or to show your product and also get first customers. Um, like through communities, it was like Tinder. Uh, they got their first thousands of customers going to universities and to these you know, fraternities, sororities, how, how it's called. Mm. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Just trying to tell that your crush is already registered here. Would you try this? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then they ran to from girls community. When they understood that girls started to register, they uh, ran to the boys guys. community trying yeah. to <laughs> explain mm. that, that already some girls are waiting for, for yeah. them. Something like that. Yeah. Yes. And so, uh, a lot of uh, so first of all uh, i think startups should use these free tools and after that when you are at a scale stage you can mm. hire anyone who will give you leads uh, at a good price or something like that you've, yeah. you've heard of the red bull story red bull? how they uh, were promoting yeah. it at the beginning like they would just um they weren't advertising but what they would do is they would get all their empty cans and mm. throw them in the trash. Yeah. So that uh, anytime you someone goes to throw something in the trash, there's, there's an empty can, couple of cans. Of, yes. What's this Red Bull that everybody's mm. drinking, finishing, and throwing away? And that's how they. I'm sure the story yeah. is better than that, but that was no, no. But <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's nice. But the, so th this thing that you're that you're mentioning, yes, the the first approach, I think, or that's what I would suggest if I were a founder as well. Now, if I'm doing my tech startup tomorrow, um, the first approach is to exhaust all the possibilities that you have at your disposal. But in the end, when you're going to, 
the universities, when you're going to the community, when you're going to anyone to talk about this, you are telling the story of your of your startup. Sure. So in that case, I mean, there are two phases in which you can either you develop it yourself, like you know the story that you want to tell, you know the idea that is fueling your company. Um, and the second one is, okay, when you want to go from that point to the next one, and that's when uh, this agency is coming. Mm. Um, but I think there, there's an interesting point in this, um, two interesting points in this. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to develop both. I will start with the first one and then we'll see about the second one. Uh, the second one is AI that I wanted to, to discuss a little bit. But in terms of um, agencies today, I think that the the social media marketing agency, the way that it was conceived 10 years ago, it's a business that no longer exists in the same way. And this is because of the people running the agencies 10 years ago. Uh, the way that it used to work, of course, at that time, a lot of things matter in terms of uh, engagement. So it was like the hashtags and the posting and everything was picture at that time. So the design matter mattered a lot more. Um, but then there were like bad practices, like getting to the, going to these engagement farms and buying like a lot of likes and this. So it gave the idea to the client that, oh, you're getting a lot of reach. In the meantime, I'm getting paid, but nothing is happening, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the social media platforms realized this as well. So they kept changing all the algorithms. And now the only thing that matters is the engagement that you get. And the key uh, content today is video. So it's very difficult for an agency to say, okay, I will provide for you one daily video that is going to be exactly what you're looking for. And it's going to talk to your niche and it's going to engage people organically. Um, and it's what you need for you and for 12 other companies that I have. It's very difficult, right? To, I mean, it's illogical to assume that someone will be able to deliver that. So I think the, the evolution of this business should be actually to combine in a way the strategy or the knowledge that the agency may have on the business that you want to, the target audience that you want to communicate your idea. And then I would advise founders to actually build even a small marketing team inside right. and say, okay, I have this, one of these kids is working for me now and he has all the, all day to experiment whatever may work for us. Create content. To create Just content, to this, to do that, mm -hmm. based on the guidance that I'm getting from the agency. So the agency is gonna suggest this, 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 and this strategy, maybe use these words, maybe do these things. All right, now go and create and find what actually works for you. I have the feeling that the business is going to evolve towards that that side. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because you can't time your, you know, let's say the social media agency have to, you know, provide 20 mm -hmm. videos or short form videos. How do you time it? How do you, yeah. you need someone in house. And that's why I'm myself, I'm decided to switch from an agency to, I need to hire someone for this. And I could probably get someone for half the price that I'm paying the agency. In the end, I'm gonna do the caption and the hashtags all myself anyway. So I just need someone, as soon as I get the bright idea and wanna be recorded, they're there. Yeah, that, mm. that is my, my suggestion in collaboration with them. With, uh, with companies. But sorry, now before we, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but there's something I wanted to, to discuss with you because it's a very uh, like hot topic today, which is AI. Actually we've done, we're gonna do 13 episodes of this podcast and I believe in 12 of them, at least we talk <clears throat> about AI in all the aspects that we can. Uh, but one that is interesting because you mentioned about the mid journey logos and well, AI for using logos. Uh, so what do you think in terms of uh, the future of marketing and AI, how are the, these two elements going to work together? Um, you know, I work with a lot of NGOs and, and youth led organizations, um, trying to help with, within sustainability and, and it's really helping out in terms of helping young people in education. Um, it's good. It's a, it's a good tool. I mean, I always say it's like a bit of a mantra is, um, knowledge is power and information is free. And now that we're in this AI where everyone can get information for free anyway, before it felt like everyone was holding back. 
like they wouldn't share their experiences or they wouldn't give advice because they felt like, you know, this person's just going to one up me. Now it's kind of like leveled it out in a way that everyone has the information. Now, what do you do with it? Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's a good, it's a good time to be in because it feels like people are more open to create and to share more so than before where everyone was kind of like, should I share this? Am I going to get ridiculed? Like it's, now it's kind of like, let's just do it and, and see what happens. Yeah. I have, I have a bit of a love hate relationship <laughs> with it. Um, I use it just to speed things up. Uh, but I will, or I will never take it as the final product. So mm -hmm. if we talk about kind of, for example, I'll give you two examples. So I might use Canva to help design something and I might use chat GPT to do something with words, but I will never take what I've created mm, on yeah. them and publish. I still have to put my touch on it. And I think a mistake that I see, it's, it's good, but it's just not quite there yet. Mm, it's not yeah. clean enough yet. And a lot of um, a mistake that I see, I, it's so obvious when I see a chat GPT article, especially on LinkedIn. Yes. If the minute I see the word unlock, uh, I was going to say, <laughs> unlock, like elevate, unlock, elevate, elevate, unleash, yeah, embark. That's it. that's it, done. I've, you've lost all credibility for me. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, we, it's not at the stage where we can just give it carte blanche and, mm. and uh, take what it's produced. So I am... Um, yeah, I'm not there yet. <laughs> well, if I would run now a marketing agency, I would, I don't know, maybe every month I would search something in YouTube, like AI for marketers. And I would uh, explore what has happened, what was added and what has changed because uh, things uh, evolving dramatically fast and a lot of so now I use of course uh, ChatGPT for example paid version yeah it helps to write me, uh, articles but do you think that the 3.5 writes worse articles than the four because I paid for four uh, and I can't see much difference well now they have GPT agents uh, mm -hmm. and they have an agent uh, who helps to write articles mm -hmm. and when you give him a prompt he asks you some uh, several questions like mm -hmm. what is the audience you want to write in which style you want so before you uh, reply uh, it, it will not start writing and it's it's a great you know it's like a live person but mm -hmm. what can I uh, say these articles never uh, ha have a lot of use in LinkedIn I don't mm -hmm. know why it blocks it so for example if I write by my own uh, it can have I don't know like two or five thousand uh, like engagements or views. And if I write by uh, ChatGPT, it never achieves may maybe one thousand. It's uh, the highest mm. mark. So Because it will look like plagiarism because it was probably pulled yeah, yeah. from so something on LinkedIn. LinkedIn mm. GPT blocks mm. ChatGPT mm. and all this stuff happens because mm. LinkedIn wants to sell you his own uh, GPT. Uh, you yeah. saw this button like uh, use AI in mm. LinkedIn when you start, yeah, start yeah, to write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you press use AI and uh, if you want to use pay for the AI. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it works like this. Uh, so, but I would discover and I would explore every week like what happened uh, because uh, things uh, uh, just I don't know if I I don't do this one day I can lose the market because my competitors will use it right yeah mm -hmm. so it works like this I think agreed okay we I, I was gonna say you, you mentioned if I were running an agency uh, we are I, I'm not keeping up to AI all the time uh, but I do think it's an amazing tool if we use it properly. I think one of the advantages, it's an advantage and a disadvantage at the same time, if you may, but um, it came kind of to replace anything that can be done uh, average. I don't, I'm, I don't yeah. want to say mediocre because it yeah. has like a negative connotation, but the average. If my, my um, position regarding this is, if what we can do can be replaced with AI, then we should let AI do it and we should focus on whatever we can do that AI cannot and how to leverage that tool to enhance the work that we are doing already. Mm. One of the great uses, uh, aside from the creative thing, I, I mean, ideally, I would like never to use AI for creative stuff, 
and only use it for uh, analysis and logistical stuff that I don't want to spend time doing and spend time creating ourselves. Uh, but everything related to data analysis and all of that, mm. it is a great tool because it will allow us to take all the data of whatever thing we're putting out there, run it by an AI that will tell us, okay, these are the conclusions out of the performance that, that you have done so far. Uh, and that gives you an advantage, let's say, because it's time that we would have spent trying to analyze all the data that we have and come up with better campaigns. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the end, I think I'm sure that most um, most people went through this whenever a new technology was being introduced. However, with, with AI, I think it's not a thing that came and will go away. This is part of our lives now and will be here forever. Um, but you know, there's still sure. graphic designers, there's still copywriters, yeah. Yeah. and I will still go to a copywriter, even though we have access to, but the, this, the value that they bring, there's like a melody to the words mm. rather than, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, here's what makes sense. Well, this is what I was going on about with the logo earlier on. Do we know if that logo is made by Luca.com mm. or whatever? Yeah. yeah. We don't know. Uh, mm. It will come a time where we won't, won't be yeah. able to know. Mm. This is the DIY approach. So I'm thinking, yeah, am I being ripped off here? I'm just, just do it myself. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. I thank enjoyed you. this discussion. Um, and well, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.